Yeah, yeah. Oh, my baby, you know money, no day. Baby, I be okay. I will not play. I go work hard. I know my body. Take a look at me now. Everything gonna change soon. Make you be with me now. Am I all done and you're gone too soon? Baby, I be find you. Hello, my name is Rahul. I mean, Quander. And I am a Washingtonian here in the District of Columbia, and I am part of the famous, infamous Quanda family. And we trace our ancestral roots uh, in this country back at least to the 1670s. And uh, the name Quanda is part of the Fati name. I'm Quando, a Fati people from Cape Coast in Ghana. And we are their American cousins, and I'm delighted to participate in this interview. Family uh, came here involuntarily, probably in 1660s. We don't know for sure. We have found our name on a list, and it says families in the 1670s. They haven't found the original, so we don't know what year, what year in the 1670s. However, in a will of 1684, uh, a man named Henry Adams, who was a colonial legislator from Ireland, he wrote his last will and testament, and in that will, he provided for the freedom of two of his four enslaved people, Henry Quando. Henry Adams gave Henry his first name, and we're quite sure that was not his given name. And uh, they spelled it Q-U-A-N-D-O, which we know from our contact with the Akan people and the language. The Q-U would be K-W. And uh, we believe that it had an A at the beginning, and it's probably the silent H, so when asked the name and said, I'm Quando, to untrained ears, they would have heard, I am Quando. And in the family, we also have the oral story of two brothers brought here uh, from the islands, which was where they were transported the enslaved to Maryland, and got separated. And this, uh, Henry Quando, of course, we believe is part of that line of which we are descended. And through the term, some of us got free, some of us didn't because they had children and slavery was not structured as formally as it later became. So eventually some of the ancestors under the name of Carter ended up at Mount Vernon. They were enslaved to George Washington. And when George Washington died and he, his will uh, eventually freed those who were enslaved, one of the women, Nancy Carter, married a free black man, Charles Quander, thus introducing the name Quander to the Virginia side where it had already been on the Maryland side. So we are one of the oldest consistently documented African-American families in the United States. Fully documented from 1684, referenced from the 1670s. And as the family has developed generationally, we are primarily four descendant groups of Quanders, all related, and the family prides itself in the fact that we have taken the knowledge that we've had of who we were as African people and our ancestral history, particularly as Ghanaians, because we've done our DNA tests and other places show up, but it's definitely verified also to be Ghana. And I had the privilege of going to uh, Cape Coast uh, several years ago in 1991 and meeting many branches and people of the Amquando group. We were featured in several newspapers. The Mirror, for example, had a full article on us about three different times while we were there. And the family's history has been documented in the Smithsonian three different times. We are not in the current Museum of African American History and Culture. They decided to give somebody else a turn, which is all right. We had that exhibit in there that, um, that included the Quanda family. It was there for 15 years after the revolution, everyday life in America, uh, 1780 um, to... Um, to 1800. I guess that's 20 years. Okay. So we were there. Uh, the exhibit was, was there for 15 years, but it was focused on a 20-year period in American history. And we've had several very important accomplishments in the family. And I just want to mention a couple of them. First of all, one of our ancestors fought very valiantly in the Civil War, and he survived and, and was uh, saluted and recognized as such. Secondly, we have four generals. This is generals in the United States military. No other African-American family has or has ever had four generals in the family. And we may be the only American family. I don't know about the white families, but we've had four. And uh, our cousin, Nellie Quander, who is part of the group, she was the first national president of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. 
And that we also have four streets named Quander, one in Washington, D.C., and two in Virginia, and one in, in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. And I am the founder and president of the Quanda Historical and Educational Society. We are created to, doc to first discover and uncover, to document, to protect, to share our history, and to use it as an educational tool for other people. I travel all over where I'm invited to and address groups and talk about the history of the Quanda family. But the emphasis is upon helping them to understand what they can do to discover their own histories because nobody has a lock on it and whatever we have done somebody else can do maybe not as much maybe even more but it's important for families particularly african-american families to understand that we built this united states when i say built it i mean we physically block on block brick on brick built certain very important buildings and we contributed and built among others of course built the united states capitol building built the white house built george washington's house at mount vernon thomas jefferson's house at monticello so the fabric of american society is the backbone of american society is built upon those who were enslaved who work from can't see in the morning all day to can't see at night and it is now that we are trying to finally and belatedly bring that story so that people understand that this is not black history, it's not African American history, it is American history. And that is our focus. Growing up as a young man, when did the realization hit you about the importance, the significance of the family in which you were born into? That's a very good question. Growing up as a child, I really didn't appreciate or understand the, what it meant to, quote, to be a quander. And when I went to Howard University in 1961, right out of high school, I was still 17, and I met a number of students from West Africa. And as they began to know my name and what have you, they would always call me Mr. Quando. And I'd be correcting them and say quander. And one day, one of them said, you know, you don't even know the history of your name. And I didn't quite understand what they were talking about. So it wasn't until 1968 when I went to my first Quanda family reunion that I began to understand that there was so much more than I as a teenager and as a young person knew. And that took my interest. And from 1968 to the present, I've been on this mission to find out more about where our people came from, who they were, what contributions they made, because so many of the things that have been done are referenced in a written record or in oral history, and with the, with the passage of time, the written records are still there waiting to be looked up and discovered or rediscovered, but the oral history can easily get lost. Fortunately, we have an attitude and a belief that we as Quanders are special people, not to show off, but to recognize that we have a mission and an obligation. So we have worked very hard to tighten up our old history to turn it into written history. I've written a book, and the title is not uh, confirmed, but right now the working title is The Quander Family Since 1684, An Enduring African-American Legacy. The only thing missing from the book is to find a publisher who's willing to take it up and do it. And it'll be my fourth book, so I am an accomplished writer and author, but I really do want to bring this book to, to four as quickly as possible. Tell us a little bit about the picture behind you. You look um, uh, dressed in a judge's um, garb. Okay, it's well, that's very right. good. I am a retired judge. I went to Howard University undergrad, class of 66, Howard University Law School, class of 69, and I retired as a senior administrative law judge for the District of Columbia, that's Washington, D.C., in 2011. And that portrait was painted by my wife, Carmen, who is a professional artist. So she captured me in my robe uh, before I retired in 2011, and that picture adorns uh, my living room. Yeah, my wife painted that. She's a professional artist. She's trained in uh, Washington, D.C. and New York. She's trained in Russia also. So she is well-recognized and an accomplished artist. Yes, professional artist. So, so what happened at Howard University, I had a number of students from West Africa. They weren't necessarily from uh, Ghana, but they were telling me that my name, I did say, you don't know who you are history. You don't know the history of your name. And nobody in the family never said anything to me at that time about it. Uh, they would say, your name is not. Quander, Q-U-A-N-D-E-R, it's, it's Quando, and it's K, 
And eventually, I began to ask people around and everybody in the family. And some said, well, there's a history, but we're not exactly sure what it is. Apparently, it hadn't been too well passed down. It was there in the records to be found. And then when I began to meet more people from West Africa, Ghana in particular, Sierra Leone in that area, they would say that it's a Fonti name and that there must be people over there uh, in, the, in the Fonti area, uh, which we recognize as predominantly Ghana, um, that it, uh, have a name of a similar nature. So in 19... 84, when we were preparing to celebrate 300 documented years in America, 1684, 1984, which celebration incidentally had over a thousand people coming from the general public in addition to the family. It was covered by ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, World Radio France International, BBC, and other uh, entities, news entities. Um, the, the full story began to unfold. We communicated with the uh, the press in Ghana and the mirror and the graphic printed a story and we received uh, at least 75 responses from Ghana and then when we eventually went there but not till 91 we were covered fully in in Ghana but we celebrated 300 documented years and we began to have a fuller understanding and of who we were and the documents that we were documenting the family had been pretty much pulled out of the historical records by 1984. But the world came to know who the Quandas are and who the Quandas were through the decades and the centuries from that time period. And among those who enslaved Quanda ancestors, I think I mentioned, was George Washington. So you can't be more high visibility than being the enslaved to the first president of the United States. So. I've been very blessed to be on this mission. Uh, it is my life's mission. My name, Rahul Amin, uh, is a Muslim name because my grandfather's from India. On my mother's side went from India. And Rahul Amin is understood to be the Archangel Gabriel, who is the messenger. Angel of the Lord said unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. So that's the Archangel Gabriel. That's what my name is understood to represent. It doesn't translate to Gabriel. But by coincidence, my great-grandfather on my father's African-American side, his name was Gabriel also. So I am the messenger. I'm 75 years old now. And who knows how much time is left. So I must be on this mission to continue to do what it means to be a quander. Because we're we, we very special about that. We don't show off, but we want people to understand that there is a responsibility of children, especially in our family, that it is a responsibility uh, when one has that name and what it means beyond just a name. It's just, it represents sustained accomplishment, it represents dedication and focus, and it represents a willingness to share with others what we have accomplished, not for any other reason. Hopefully, well maybe other reasons, people may say, oh, you're so honored, so lucky. We're not lucky. It just so happens by the accident of birth that I got this name. And therefore, by accident of birth, I have a responsibility. And I have taken it upon myself. That's why this book is so important to get it published. Because it is the written quintessential compilation of 50 years plus of my personal writing and pulling together the Quander story. So that regardless of who, what, when, where, and how, that will be preserved in writing. And so that is what I'm focused on. Yeah, now this portrait you're looking at, this is a very important example of an Aquanda who's done a lot. This lady is Nellie Quander. She went to Howard University, was the first national president of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. She is descended from West Ford, who is the uh, uh, putative son of Bushrod Washington, which and, and he was the nephew of George Washington. So Nellie Quander apparently is related to, by blood to the Washington family. She was a founder of the YWCA. She was very involved with the NAACP. And she was extremely active in the women's suffrage movement that is responsible for getting women the right to vote. She is a good example of a hard-working Quanda person who's dedicated and focused, whose mission was to serve and be of service. And um, she is but one, and we have several others, but I like to point her out because she's sort of a universal person, and I like to use her as a role model for myself because I'm committed and focused on being of service. 
A very important part of our history, what we treasure very much, is how much we have served our nation in uh, defense and in, in search of democracy. This cousin here, John Pearson Quant, was a Civil War veteran, much decorated. You see him right here. That's Nellie Quant's father. This cousin here, Richard Ignatius, he was Civil War. Richard Ignatius was Spanish-American War. And here he is here. He was a musician, Spanish-American War. These two gentlemen, Peter and John Edward, they were first cousins. They were, they were World War I. And this man right here, Charles Johnson Quander, also depicted here, he was a Tuskegee Airman. This cousin here, Charles, John, uh, Charles uh, Calvin Quander, rode with Pancho Villa in the Mexican Revolution. And Nellie Quander is here because during World War I, she was put in charge of monitoring the working conditions for colored women in the World War I war effort. So she deserves quite a bit of recognition for that purpose. So the Quanders in military service, I mentioned that we have four generals in the family. No other family we know of, definitely not African American, has four generals, three of whom went to West Point. So we are very proud of our heritage and we recognize that freedom is not free and as Americans we have a responsibility despite the fact of how we've been treated and mistreated because of our color and because of our race. And uh, this is part two of the same Quantas and Military Service. And here are brother and sister Robert Augustine and Helen Brent uh, uh, Quander. And uh, this is a recognition of the fact that Cousin James, we don't have a photo of him, he died in the Normandy invasion in uh, 1944. Now, I mentioned that we had um, four generals in the family, and here you happen to have three of them. No, they're all four here. Um, this is General Leo Brooks Sr., General Leo Brooks Jr., General uh, Vincent Keith Brooks, and he has now been promoted to general, says Lieutenant Colonel. He's now General Francis Quanda. So these are four generals. And General Francis Quanda's wife is Colonel. So we have quite a bit of con continuity about Quanda's in military service dedicated to the freedom of our nation. So for Black History Month 2018, there was an exhibit in Prince George's County, and they honored African Americans who were in World War I service. And we had uh, cousin Evelyn Quanda Ratley, whose father's on the other side, he was a World War I veteran. And here we took a picture of the Quanders who were in attendance at the exhibit. And this is my cousin, Dr. Joseph Quander. He's a retired pediatrician, and he served in the Air Force uh, back in the 1960s. So this is our Quanders in military service. One question that comes up often is, were the Quanders among the group that came here in 1619? The answer is we don't know, we don't think so. But August 1619 uh, represented the first year that the men who would become enslaved Africans were brought to this country. And I like to tell people the Civil Rights Movement really began in August 1619 because in 1619 and, and from that point forward, the enslaved Africans and people of color were treated in a disparate manner from uh, the way the white settlers were coming in. Even though we had whites who came in here as indentured servants, after the period of their servitude, they were generally free, able to buy land, able to vote, able to marry in, and become, quote, Americans. That was not accorded to those who were enslaved. And we were in servitude from that point forward. The various laws passed by the, the colonies and later the states were focused on keeping us in permanent, indefinite, servitude forever. We were very fortunate though in the Quanda case that the two brothers, I told you I mentioned two brothers, two brothers came here and were brought here and one got his freedom under the will of 1684 and the other was stayed in servitude and did not get his freedom until slowly emancipation brought everybody out of servitude. So we have these two brothers who were caught in servitude. And after uh, slavery was formally ended then we had a period of the Knight Riders, the Ku Klux Klan, and then we had segregation and Jim Crow laws, and then we had to have, after all of that, we fought in the Spanish-American War, we fought and died in, the, um, in World War I and World War II, and even after that time, we continued 
to be separated and segregated. And it's very disturbing when people of the current generation say, well, I didn't have anything to do with slavery, so why should you say that um, I am responsible or you talk about white privilege? They don't understand, or if they do, they choose to ignore the fact that slavery and everything related to it was the most integral part of Western civilization and American economy and history. The cotton that was grown, the corn that was grown, the tobacco that was grown, the sugar that was grown, all of that was grown by enslaved labor. The earliest part of some of that manufacturing done by enslaved labor. The shipping industry, the very fact that the shipping industry was so large. A lot of people don't realize the shipping industry was based in Massachusetts and Rhode Island because that's where the bigger shipping companies were. And what did they carry back and forth? Back from, from Europe to, uh, to Africa and then Africa to the Americas, they enslaved people. And if you know anything about the economies of these countries and why it took so long to get rid of formal slavery and why with the perpetuation of the same attitude, it's about economics. I just finished reading the book Capitalism and Slavery by Sir Eric Williams, former Prime Minister of Trinidad, former professor at Howard University. He lays it out so well, and he's not the only one. It talks about the fact that the whole history, underpinning of American history, and American economic and political history, is based upon slavery. So I think people need to understand that. Here we are in the 21st century, 400 years after the first Africans were brought here in, in, in uh, 1619, and we still are captured in political, economical, and psychological slavery. And until we face it, until America faces it, whether we call it reparations or some other plan, uh, we are not going to go anywhere. We, we, when we say that we are post-racial as a result of having had an African-American president, President Obama, every step along the way, he was being opposed by one group or another. And we know as well, it's not politics alone. We know much of that opposition was racially based. And of course, the ugly head after he's gone, uh, after the President uh, Obama, the ugly head of the current administration, the Trump administration, all the racial things that have come up and things that have clearly focused on uh, discrimination have come up and it's like we're back in the 1950s. I remember segregation. I'm 75 years old. I remember segregation very well. Not as ribald as it was in Mississippi, but we had it here in Maryland, Virginia, and in D.C. it was here too until 1953. This is history. I, have, I didn't start that. The center of the slave trade during the slave period, this is the economic center, was Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Those are the two places. That shows you the shipping industry that created all sorts of opportunities, as, and these are the economic opportunities that those who are benefited from are still enjoying. The ratio of African American to Caucasian net worth, depending upon what statistic you look like, is about 10 to 1. 10 to 1. That's the accumulated knowledge as a result of having been able to do this generation upon generation upon generation of accumulated wealth. And most blacks, not all, but most are still living paycheck to paycheck. You just talked a lot about um, slavery and generation to generation, which brings to mind this um, interesting question. That is, in August of the year 2019, it will be 400 years since the first um, Africans were, against their will, shipped through Ghana and brought into the Americas to begin the whole process of the transatlantic slave trade experience. Um, what are some of the ways you would like both African Americans and Africans, not just on the continent but all over the world, to you know remember this whole rather unfortunate experience, and how do you um, advise to use it as a bedrock to move on to become better people and better countries? To say, first of all, I think awareness is the most important beginning. To be aware of the fact that the first enslaved Africans they were brought here. They didn't have the title enslaved at the moment because it quickly went into that. But they were brought here as indentures. But the whites who came served a short period of time and then they were free. For the blacks, it was really the beginning of permanent servitude. So I think people need to be aware of the fact that American 
chattel slavery is, was different from the slavery that we've had for thousands of years. In the ancient uh, times, Europe, Rome, wherever, uh, when they had a war and they captured people, put them into slavery, they were the same color, sometimes the same culture. Within a generation or two, those, a lot of those people married into the family and became like Moses. So that disappeared. But they need to understand that what happened to the enslaved Africans who came to this country who were denied citizenship. The courts even said that they couldn't be citizens. It took the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to change all of that freedom, right to vote, protection of the law. People need to know by opening up the minds that here is a group of people who have been so roundly discriminated against, but the Museum of African American History and Culture is addressing that issue. And still I rise. Maya Angelou, I had the privilege of knowing her. And still I rise. I'm reading Barracoon by Zora Neale Hurston. It's a story of the Clotilda, the last slave ship. It was an illegal smuggle ship. It was after slave trade, but the last slave ship, and Mr. Cujo Lewis, I was from Sierra Leone, who was on that ship, believed to be, and he might not have been the very last, but he was on the last ship, and believed to have been the last enslaved person. You know when he died? Something around 1930. Uh, and can you imagine we had people who were smuggled in here all the way at that time? People need to know that because knowing it helps you to understand why we will not put up with it. When you get an opportunity and your fellow African has been denied an opportunity, but he's prepared academically or culturally or technically, whatever it is, lift him, lift him up and still arise, extend a helping hand because we have to lift others as we ourselves climb. We don't exist in isolation. We've got to understand that we as a group of people, whether we, we spoke different languages, we came from different places in Africa, and that was intentional to keep us separated because by keeping us separated, we be, could be clawing at each other's throats, not being able to communicate. We're all in the same barracoon, which is a barrack. We're all in the same place, but we can't communicate with each other because they intentionally mix us up to keep us separated, to keep us down. We have come beyond that. So we've got to be united as a people. We've got to be brothers and sisters, descendants. We're not Africans, we're African American. But our brothers from Africa, our sisters from Africa, we are brothers, if not certainly cousins. So we have a family connection and obligation to each other. You're writing a book. It's probably your third or fourth book. The fourth book, yes. Tell us a little bit briefly about that book and why you're writing it. Well, this book is the title of the book, working title, The Quanta Family Since 1684, An Enduring African-American Legacy. Our family is one of the first African-American families here. We have full documents from 1684, but we're referenced on a list in the 1670s. We have pulled out so much information from the American Revolutionary Period, 1800s, 1900s, 20th century. Our history is to identify, document, preserve, share, and use it as an educational tool. So this is not only to help us protect our own history, which is very important, but to get other African-American families and Americans in general in the world at large to understand that, th that people of color in this country have persevered and accomplished despite anything and everything. So these are the types of things that are so very important because it shows that we are integral part of the American fabric. We're not a postage stamp. We're an integral part of the fabric. We're embedded into American society, culture, and history. And as a tour guide, because after I retired as a judge here in Washington, D.C., I became a tour guide because I wanted to share my knowledge, my education, and entertain at the same time. So I want people to understand that what I'm talking about is not uh, African-American history alone. It's American history. So this is when I talk to people everywhere. I want them to understand that this is the story of who we, the Kwandas, are as a people, as an inspiration for anybody else. Now how can people reach out to connect um, with you? Oh, I'm so easy to find. <laughs> you can do info at quantaquality.com, info at quantaquality.com. You can do quantaquality at gmail.com. 
And you can also support our GoFundMe page. I'm trying to raise funds to get this book published. The book is written. It needs some editing. But I need to get it published. This is my fourth book. So my funds are all depleted as right. far as being able to underwrite the cost. So I would appreciate any support and all support. And I also welcome inquiries. I do a lot of public speaking around the country. I've got some dates coming up next year, even the rest of this year. So I'm, I'm open for invitation. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Well, you heard him. He's open for invitation and to reach out and connect. You can see the address scrolling right there on the bottom of your screen. Reach out, connect. He's a treasure trove of working <laughs> encyclopedia. I'd like to say that myself. And it's been such an honorable pleasure meeting. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us Absolutely. to your home and sharing Absolutely. some of your interesting stories with thank us. Thank you. Any last words for our viewers? Uh, I would just like to say that. Uh, we in the Quanda family are very specific in saying we're not the only ones. We are setting a tone for what we want other people to do as far as recognizing their own histories, documenting their own histories. It's about family. We don't exist in isolation. We're all part of a large family, whether it's blood or association. So I would like to encourage everybody to go do something and reach out and touch somebody, just like I'm reaching out to touch you. Thank you very much. Pleasure, sir. Pleasure. Okay. Right. Thank you. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my baby, you know money, no day. Baby, I be okay. I will not play. I go work hard. I know my body. Take a look at me now. Everything gonna change soon. Make you be with me now. And my order, and you're gone too soon. Baby, I better find you.